welcome to the birds and the bees session. On the presentation side tonight, we have Jane Sellers and Brian Timms, who you can see just giving you a wee wave there on the one camera together. Brian is a, a representative, I'm not sure what exactly your title a member. is here. Member of the British Trust for Ornithology. So Brian has a wealth of experience there. And you'll have been able to read everybody's bios and what they'll be talking about. We've got a bit about the birds and a bit about the bees. And then uh, Delia and Kat are the, the second two presenters there. We also have Abby Morden, uh, who's joining us for the roundtable discussion. And hopefully we'll have uh, one of the council officers, Gillian Dick. Uh, she hasn't made it into the waiting room right now, but we are eagerly watching out for her arrival. If not, Abby will be a capable leader of the roundtable discussion, a roundtable of one, but everyone will have a chance to ask questions. Abby is from Propagate, uh, which she'll be able to tell you more about later. But we have a packed session, so I'm not going to say very much more. Oh, just oh. just uh, one comment. Um, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Chris. I'll be uh, monitoring the chat. Um, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to pop in in the chat while people are chatting uh, or presenting. Um, <laughs> So that if you feel like you, you just don't want to forget your questions, we will be monitoring it and, and make sure that it comes up. So um, feel free to pop anything in there as well. Jean, okay. you're up first. Are you ready to go? I am indeed. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I'll start sharing my screen. And uh, you can just tell me when you want me to move on from one slide to the next. Hello, everybody. Um, this is my first official Zoom, apart from with family. So nobody kind of... Um, going in with faces in the way that the children do. So my, my, as I said, my name is Jane and one of my lifelong interests has been what the wild bees and I suppose principally bumblebees because they're so in your face and everybody can see them. But also, you know, what we do for the bees. I'm also into butterflies, day and night flying moths and, and bats as well. So, but today's just kind of about, about bees. So I, I don't know a massive amount about bees but you know, I don't think you need to know a massive amount about them to actually give them a little, a little helping hand uh, along. So the picture that you can see on your screen is part of our allotment. We've had allotments, Brian and I, since 2007. And principally, although we, we grow some crops for ourselves, the, the major thing that I enjoy is doing it for my little furry friends, my bee friends, the fab wee guys who are so cute and so nice. And in that picture, you can see at the front, at the front of it, there is some, um, sorry, at the, the right hand side at the front, you'll see some verbena, which is really, really good for bees. And you get all sorts of different kinds of verbena. And on the left hand side, the little purple ones are giant knapweed. And then right at the back, you see some borage. But probably if you, you're used to an allotment that's quite bare, you'll see it's a little bit wild, you know. So that's the first thing. So can I have a picture one? Now, here we are. This is, I've enhanced the colouring slightly at this point, so it maybe wasn't quite as blue as that, but this is a little common carda bee, which looks like there's been a little orange fun for, and one of the flowers, which I can't remember, I think it's called um, sea holly or something. Somebody will tell me what that is. I cannot remember the name of that flower. So they're just so nice bees, and they have had a really rough time. But even if we're thinking about, you know, why would we be interested kind of because we are, but if you think about it from a selfish point of view, one third of the food that we eat has to be pollinated by bees. So that would be, you know, honeybees and wild bees as well. So this is a little common car to be. Bees, probably we're speech, speaking to the converted here, but a lot of insects have suffered a lot over, the, over my lifetime simply because of our increasing use of insecticides to grow food and you know we have really good insecticides but that has made bee numbers crash so you win on one side you lose on the other but from the bees point of view it's, it's made their numbers crash so if you look at you know a little statistic 97 percent since world war ii we've lost 97 percent of our wildflower meadows so it's a huge amount for our for our, our wild bees which are all around us so if we can, one of the things we could do, you know, is avoid using insecticides in our allotment. It's particularly the, the big killer has been the neonicotinoids, but I think you can sometimes get it in um, domestic ones that you might want to use in plants. So 
to be avoided if you can. So what, what can we do though? We can grow plants that flower and as early in the year as possible to late in the year as possible. So from March to October, if we can grow something that flowers or we can make sure something flowers, which I'll chat about later, then the bees have got a chance. Also, you're helping other pollinators, moths, day and night flying moths as well, which are, are fabulous. And we don't really see night flying ones, but they enjoy all the plants that the bees enjoy as well. So variety, because you've got different sizes of bees, so they've all need different sizes of plants. So they're, they're, you know, some of them can't suck from the same ones as the big ones can and the wee ones can't suck from. So you need a, a good variety and we can all help. So can I have picture two, please? Picture two, now here, close to my heart, is little tree bees. Tree bumblebees, actually, I think technically they're called. Now these are new introductions to the UK. They came in in 2001 and they've steadily moved up and are now in Scotland. And we've had them for a few years at the allotment. We also had a, a nest in our lockup here in the city centre as well. So they, they're not fussy little critters. They nest in some unusual places. They'll, they'll nest in bird boxes. But as I say, we had one in our lockup here, you know, right in the city centre. They were nesting between a mirror and a, and a piece of cloth. They will nest under your floor. We, uh, not under your floor in the house, but in the allotment, we had, um, we've had two or three nests under the floor of our, our tomato, um, place where we grow tomatoes. But one of our neighbors also had them, they were flying through what was a, a lock hole, flying through the lock hole and were nesting in the lining of a jacket that was hanging in the back of the door. So these guys are adaptable and they're really um, cute as well. So can we have the next one, please? Picture three, there's a little video, so. But these guys, this was in a strawberry planter. This was our third nest, which was in a strawberry planter. And they didn't do that well there because it was such a hot summer. And these guys are actually, if we can see the video, they're actually trying to cool the strawberry planter. Um, not doing very well because it was really hot. So we tried to shade them and keep it cool, but they didn't really thrive in there. But they will, you know, go really anywhere, the tree bees. So we don't need to kind of, they, they'll find a spot, but those are interesting to look out for. Another one that we had this summer that we've probably always had but never noticed is the Willoughby leafcutter bee, which I've not got a picture of. Now, you will know them if you see them because they cut a little circle out of a leaf and then they fold it over like a taco shell and between their front and back legs, they hold a little green leaf and they fly off with it. So if you see them flying along, they're, they're kind of unmistakable. You'll definitely know it's a, a leafcutter bee. And if you watch where they go, it's usually rotten wood or holes in wood. And we had some rotten wood that we, we had to not take our um, hut down simply because that was what was due, but they, they found it first for us. So we had to leave it another year and it's in a hole and the, she takes in the leaf and takes it up the hole and then makes, the, this is what they use for nesting. And she would be a solitary bee, the leaf cutter bees, but you'll definitely know them if you spot them. Now, Apart from um, growing things, if, what, what if we didn't want to grow special things for the bees? Well, one of our most successful things this year has been to actually leave a few more of our crop in the allotment to go to seed. Particularly, so, or you can grow a few extras as well. We, we grew um, some purple sprouting broccoli. So the end of the summer and it overwintered and it wasn't too harsh a winter. Um, the last winter we've killed this year's. And I'm not that keen on purple sprouting broccoli. So we had it and we had it soup, and we steamed it and we fried it and we did it. And then we still had loads of purple sprouting broccoli and we kind of went, uh. so we left it and it created this amazing bush of tiny little yellow flowers and the bees went completely berserk for it and all the other insects as well. So if you're doing purple sprouting broccoli, you're doing any crops, grow a few extra, just leave them to go to seed. Particularly, um, good has been the um, leeks as well. We always grow a section of leeks for us. And as you know, if you get the rain at the wrong time, your leek sprouts a big thing up and it will go to seeds. And usually it's quite a struggle. And it will, they have giant pom-pom heads of flowers and the bees absolutely love them. The same, so um, your leeks are great. So leave a few, even if you want to crop the rest, you know, grow a few extra. There's always hundreds of leeks, isn't there, that you grow in trays. Um, so we can have, we have picture four, please. 
Ah, here he is. That actually at the back is, I think that's a buff-tailed um, bumblebee. And he, or she, I keep calling them he's, and they're not the she's because they're all the workers, it's the she's. And she is on a leek flower. So they, they and they're great big, because so you can see how big the flower must be, because these are quite big bumblebees. So the leeks are, are fabulous. So onions as well, leave your onions. And even if you have lettuce, cabbage, anything that looks as if it's going to sprout, just leave a few. So thinking about other things, I know I don't want to steal the thunder of uh, um, the next presenters, but I thought I would briefly chat about the types of crops and plants that actually we found are successful in our allotment. So spring, I think don't make your allotment or your garden or anywhere, don't like take out everything and make it just a bland area, leave a bit wild. So dandelions, crocus, daffodils and comfrey, you get loads of comfrey that you can get a root for the comfrey and um, all your fruit trees and bushes are coming in early in the spring so they're all fabulous for the early queens and I've got an azalea bush that I kind of picked up cheap somewhere. The chives are fabulous as well. They're one of the early ones. So all of your herbs are useful, but in the spring, the chives will come up first. And some of our perennials, we have acrylisia and all of the different summer flowers that you can do, lavender. One of the early ones is forget-me-nots. And we've had, um, they just kind of seem to seed themselves everywhere. So the forget-me-nots, the useful thing is they get loads of seeds on them and then the bullfinches eat them all. So um, these are great. Summer, I'll not go through all the different herbs, but in, this, in the summer, all of your herb plants that you can harvest, but they all have flowers in them and all of the different mints as well. And towards the end of the summer, borage. Borage is fabulous. It seems to want to grow where it wants to grow. And the nut weed that I had in that picture is easy to grow, very successful. All of the wild flowers, anything blue and purpley. But also, I think in our allotment, when we arrived, there was foxgloves and we kind of moved them around and there's the foxgloves are absolutely fabulous as well. Can I have picture five, please? Foxgloves. We've had some fabulous foxgloves and they grow in areas where you're not going to maybe want to grow crops. You see all the wilderness in the background, eh? <laughs> all of our large amounts of greenery that's not edible. And um, so damp areas, there's always plenty of things you can grow in damp areas. And the autumn, we've got honeysuckle that grows over fences. So that's good. Your thistles, normal things that blow in, you know, leave a couple of thistles, corn flowers, your natural heathers. And even if you've got any flowering ivy, it's ivy that grows up things that have flowers on it, which is fabulous for all the different things. So what else can we do? Water, they do like some water. Um, bumblebees they need a little drink but watch for your water butts and and pots of water and we have a, a basin for water for washing our hands because they go in for a drink and they will drown so you need to check them regularly fish them out dry them off in a bit of kitchen paper put them in the sun warm them up otherwise they um will, they will drown and die our water butts we have a kind of a grid floating around about the water or netting so that the water can drip in but the, the bees don't drown in them so they do need a little bit of water but there's a hundred species of bees in Scotland, but 90% of them are solitary. So all of the bumblebees, they, they nest, they do their own thing. You probably can't supply them much kind of habitat. The tree bees are pretty adaptable, but many of the solitary bees maybe do need a bit of a bee hotel, um, holds board into wood, and you can make and buy certainly bee homes. And the leafcutter bees like the holes in the wood as well. I know we're kind of short of time, so, I just want to mention that the, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust have good information and they are also interested in other insects too, but you can join them. The Scottish Wildlife Trust has a really good website as well for flowers and for bees. And also the, the RSPB, the bird people, they have good stuff on bees as well. So really that's a kind of a quick rush through. I could probably carry on forever, but we've maybe got, have we got a few minutes left just for any questions? We have a question, a couple questions uh, from a four-year-old in the chat. Um, for any of the bee people, uh, if you know, why are bees stripy and why are they furry? Oh, the, probably we'll have to get Darwin in on that one. Um, they've evolved like that, I suppose, because they're stripy, so they don't look particularly delicious. And they're furry, I don't know, maybe to keep them warm or something. But they've evolved, obviously, it suits them. 
and the um you know that's otherwise you know they've kind of evolved like that you know but they do look as if they've got little fun furs on them you know mm -hmm. which you can sit and stroke them if you get a little quiet bee that's sitting on your table you can kind of pet it <laughs> anything else anybody else want to ask any quick questions we move we on then to, to brian yeah sure just okay, a I'll very move in sideways okay <laughs> a subtle angle change on the camera from one presenter to the next <laughs> great are you Hi, ready bro. for your first photo brian or do you want yes, me to wait for thank you scott yes my first photograph thank you um thank you uh, my name is brian timms i'm a member of the british Ornithology. i've had a lifelong love of birds started by my father uh, who had a wildlife garden in the back. His excuse was having that to save doing any gardening, incidentally. He bought a greenhouse when I was about five, a flat pack one, and it was still flat pack on my 21st birthday, <laughs> so many years later, so it was a real wildlife park. So I guess I get my love of birds for that. But we have, uh, nobody needs reminding of the dire straits that the birds, and as Jane mentioned, the bees and insects, are in at the moment. Um, we have awful stats to tell us in my lifetime. I think about 60, 70% of birds have disappeared off the planet um, and it's not getting any better. Uh, the main culprits are habitat loss, insecticides, cats, which are actually not even in the top 10. So you've got a cat, put a bell on it. You can get a quick release collar for for it so you don't get caught in the coming through hedges etc so uh, this little woodpecker it's a, it's a male a male woodpecker grace is spotted i watched him clear off my apple tree within five minutes aphids from the bottom to the top by walking crawling up and clearing the whole tree of aphids so we need birds in the garden but we don't want to encourage them to come into the garden and kill them, which is what's happening at the moment. Um, the woodpecker, as you can see, is feeding on the, on the, on the suet bull uh, thing there. Can you put the next uh, picture up for me, Scott? Thank you, there's a bullfinch. We have a huge variation of birds in our allotments. There's seed eaters, ground feed eaters, insect eaters. And um, this is obviously a seed eater. So. He, he's got a fantastic beak. He can, as Jane said, he, they did a whole three or four families devoured after the, at the end of the summer, the seeds that were left on the forget-me-nots and they disappeared. You could see the, you could see the flower shaking and um, it was fabulous to see them. So leave the seeds on your, on, on, uh, on your plants. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the the fact that we can help spread, stop spread the diseases that the birds have got. And I want to talk, it's, it's called trichomonosis. Uh, can I picture five, Scott, please? It's a devastating picture of a bullfinch has got this deadly disease. And it's caused by a mite that's in our feeders and on the bird tables and in the, and in the basins. Um, it's devastating and I don't think, I haven't seen a green finch in my allotment now for maybe seven years, something like that. They've completely disappeared. Um, so we can avoid that by a simple method of housekeeping on our feeders and on the sites where our feeders are. Um, the, 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 the feeders themselves, you can clean easily. I just use boiling water. You can use some very light soluble very liquid or something, wash it off, dry it off so the mold doesn't get into the bird food. Um, I think that needs to be done at least maybe once every couple of weeks. I do mine weekly. Um, but um, it, it's more important if you do that right rather than if you don't do that, it's best not to feed the birds because you're going to, the poor little bullfinch that's got this horrible disease and it's spread all over the place. So um, we need to take care on that. Underneath the bird feeders, uh, we, you need to either move your bird feeding site or you can um, rake it like I do. I've got too many sites uh, in our nature garden. 
Um, so we rate the gun because the droppings from the, the birds on the feeders, the ground feeders, um, that's the thrushes. You know that the robin is a thrush family, the blackbirds in the thrush family. So a whole range of ground feeders that are eating and getting salmonella off. <laughs> it sounds awful what we're doing, doesn't it? An awful, um, devastating diseases to get from underneath the bird feeders. So it's important that we really do this housekeeping uh, to help the, the birds on the way. Um, our nature garden, which Jen and I are lucky, lucky enough to run, was designated a special site by um, the person that runs the biodiversity and the botanical gardens in, in Edinburgh. And we've created what was birds need more than anything. And more than anything, the biggest skill in the birds, number one, is loss of habitat. Um, loss of habitat is what we can do to help in our little allotments by creating a small, small amount of natural habitat. As Jane said earlier, leaving it a little bit rough, growing a few nettles, let the brambles grow so the birds fly through them, and creating a little natural habitat for them. Uh, um, and so that's, you know, that's one of the main things that we can do personally. And so the two main things is housekeeping on our feeders and also um, uh, help with the, with the, the feeding, where the, the areas where they feed, making that as clean as we possibly can. And don't forget the bird bath that they're always in. We also have a pond in our nature garden, which you're all welcome to come anytime. Um, we do have school children coming to see it and people from different walks of life that uh, spend it's a lovely, lovely site to come and have a look at, have a cup of tea there. You're wel welcome to do that anytime. Um, the next picture is a little wren, please. It's number three, please, Scott. Thank you. This is a little wren pictured in my garden. Um, it's a wonderful little bird. We've all got wrens in our garden. They scoot around. Their Latin name is troglodyte, troglodytus, which, is, which means cave dweller. <laughs> it's a lovely little classy name it's got. And you might be interested to know um, that the, the, the Alison Kilda has got its own special wren. It's twice the size of our common wren or the European wren that we have. And it's called um, Troglodytus troglodytus herta, which is the name of the main island there. I have seen it. It's twice the size of our wren and quite brave as well. And it's still there if you can manage to get a lift out to St Kilda at any time. Don't forget your binoculars. Uh, so the, the little bird that we've got here, you can see by his bill, a little pointy bill. Uh, he, it's an insect eating bird. And so he was scootering around, also around, and he's very vulnerable to cats, predation. They're quite slow moving, um, but they do scuttle around. And we've had them nesting above us in our little cabin uh, where we've been eating our meals and drinking tea and uh, raising four chicks. Uh, it's quite uh, unbelievable that we've had that, but so they're quite brave. Um, and uh, as the lovely little wren, I'm sure you, you've all got wrens, but need look, all these birds need looking after if you do invite them into your garden. I think we've got a goldfinch, Scott, number four. This is a classic picture of a beautiful goldfinch. The collective noun is a charm of goldfish, if you see more than three or four. Uh, he's on, on a teasel in our garden. We grow teasels because they'll grow, virtually grow anywhere in Scotland, no matter how rough, how dark. Uh, the teasels, they come in the winter and finish the, the seed heads off by pecking away um, on, on these teasel heads. So you can grow teasels. We've always got a few spare plants if anybody wants them. We grow them uh, in all dark corners and they're really good wintering food for the birds. So it's not all that necessary to fill your bird feeder up all the time if you have enough natural plants uh, for, you, for your birds to eat. Um, the, uh, the goldfinches are, are doing well. I know we've heard a lot of bad news from me and some from Jane as well. But one of the success stories of the birds is the goldfinch. And uh, nobody really knows why. Uh, the BTO will take 25 years to find out. And also, if I've got a little bit of time, not sure how I am for time, I'm usually talking for about two hours, everybody's sound asleep. 
and my got, back talks. I, I started a, a timer when you began and you've got a minute and 20 seconds left on it. Okay, well, I want to just hit a few myths, bad myths that I would like to, to publicize is that the, this is research again from the BTO um, that the, the much maligned magpie that gets blamed for killing songbirds is completely false. It's an actual fact that birds eat birds. A uh, little moorhen that you see up in the Fort and Clyde Canal, she has four, uh, four or five chicks. She will drown at least three of them, the worst behaved. Uh, so she'll know that she can only look after two. And um, so uh, it's all about leaving the species to, to, to survive and the birds know how to do that. And we can give them a helping hand in our little allotments. Uh, is that okay, Scott? Fabulous, yeah, yeah. You've come in on 30 seconds under under time there, but that just means we have more time now for questions. There are two already in the um, in the chat. Abby, do you want to ask yours by voice? I can see that you're sitting there at your camera. Yeah, um, yeah. It was just the um, the particular disease that you were talking about, there, Brian. Is that is that the one that, that's generally known as called as fat finch? Uh, well, it's, it's the, the green finches. Well, most of the the seed the seed eaters are going to use use the the bird feeders. Um, and it's, it's the seed eaters that seem to be catching this really nasty disease. And the analog best analogy of it is all, all us uh, humans eating off the same plate for months at a time and not washing the plates um, and, and, and licking the plate at the end of it. Um, I'm sure we're likely to catch something really, really nasty. Or well, even then going under the table and licking off the floor the remains that we've dropped on the floor, all well, the children have anyway. <laughs> and so um, this is why the disease is prevalent and it's really destroyed the whole greenfinch population. We used to have literally hundreds of greenfinches. We don't see any now. And they've almost disappeared. Um, so that, that, that's an important thing that you'll need to look after. Thanks. Anyone? Would anyone else like to jump in with a question? We, we do have a question there from one of our other speakers, but uh, I'll, I'll give the, the general audience a chance to come in with one before we go to cats. Um, can I just say, it's not a question, but it was um, going back to the question about the furry bumblebees. Yeah. Um, could I suggest that they maybe evolve that way so that pollen sticks to them more easily when that, they're going to eat well. flowers? Yeah, that's true as well. They, they've evolved at that, well, furry because I suppose they are furry. But yes, the pollen sticks to them and then they collect the pollen. Mm. So they, they're obviously um, cross-fertilizing plants, but also they collect the pollen off their fur and then yeah. and then take it back to their uh, nest. True, thank you. Well, mo Masters of Mediocrity, where it comes to Zoom meetings, this is our first shot apart from an eight-year-old grandson hanging upside down. So we have to excuse if we have missed things. Thank you. Not at all. Not at all. Part, but, part of the fun of doing FebFest on Zoom is uh, it's an informal way of getting everybody from across the gas spectrum together. So we're not we're not all, uh, none of us are Zoom experts by any stretch of the imagination. But okay. thanks very much, Jean and Brian. Okay. Um, Jean and Brian are still going to be here. So if anyone has any other questions, feel free to keep dropping them into the chat and we'll we'll ask them as and when we get um, time uh, later towards the end. But next up, if I stop sharing this screen, uh, we have uh, Delia. So Delia, are you ready to take the floor? Yeah, thank you. Great. Uh, just give me a shout when you want to move from one slide to the next, but here. Okay, I'll do it. If you just put the first one up, Scott. Okay, so I'm going to talk about beekeeping on an allotment uh, and how to get started. This is the main question I'm asked about. So again, as a beekeeper, I've been doing it to, since 2014 on the allotment in Springburn. And, and my understanding is you don't become an expert in beekeeping ever. Um, uh, I know someone who's been done it for nearly 40 years and he still says he's still learning. So uh, I'm going to tell you about how I kicked off beekeeping on the allotment. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, the, this is what I did when I was starting off my beekeeping. Um, and check out what's involved in keeping bees. I got a gift from my grandchildren 
in the Christmas of 2014 of the World Wildlife Pack uh, Bee Cause campaign. And I kind of looked up beekeeping and went on a course and ended up keeping my bees on the allotment that we've had for almost 13 years down in Springburn. So did a bit of checking it out and was fortunate enough to get on a course that was lottery funded. Um, so it didn't cost me anything to go on a course. So I would always encourage someone to find out a bit about it before you start. It's a great idea, but just get a bit of a sense of what's involved, what is it going to cost you, time, etc. So the basics. And um, very importantly, if you're going to keep your bees on a, a plot, on a, an allotment site, talk to folk, talk to the other plot holders, talk to your site committee. Um, it's really important. Um, beekeeping, Jane talked about wild bee, bees, but honeybees it, are what you would keep in hives. And they are a bit more like um, animal welfare. So you're kind of setting up an environment for them. You're kind of looking after them. They, they do their own thing, but you do need to let folks know that you're going to do it, particularly the, the folks around about you. Because I got good reactions but I've also come across people being a bit concerned about it. Legitimate concerns, don't be upset by it. Talk to people and I found that works pretty well. Um, the other thing that I did, I, uh, our allotment is in Glasgow, in Springburn, but we live a couple of miles up the road, which is another local authority. Beekeeping is regulated by law, <laughs> believe it or not, honey beekeeping. Um, and bylaws in different local authorities are different. So I live in Eastern Bartonshire. The bylaws here are different than they are in Glasgow. It's worth checking. And it, it's, it's good to know that because there are some criteria that you need to fulfill if you're going to set them up. It's not too complicated. And the other thing that I did on the recommendation, and I see she's on the Zoom call tonight, Margaret, um, who's our secretary, Margaret Scott, um, she, we have a private site in Springburn, but Glasgow um, City, as you probably all know, have an allotment officer and they have criteria on the website about how to set up beehives, things like the height of your fence, etc. So it's worth looking at that. And fortunately, even though we're a private site, he visited, had a wee look, said everything was fine, and it also reassured everybody else. And I think that building up that relationship and doing that, I would encourage folks to do that. Again, I've touched on the costs of setting up an apiary and the equipment. Initially, it can be expensive-ish. You can build it up gradually and, you know, but a suit can cost you, which I would encourage everyone to get, an average about £40 or so and much more if you want to spend it. A basic hive can cost you 150 pounds new um, colony of bees if you're buying them another hundred odd pounds so it can mount up you don't have to do it all at the one time obviously and I'll come on to that in a minute about how you can potentially offset the costs of that but you do need to be aware of that because it's not cheap there are opportunities to get um, grants and things uh, under environmental things as I touched on I got on a a lottery funded course and part of that was they gave me my first hive. I've brought other equipment since then but I was fortunate enough to get some, a starter kit if you like to get me going. So it's worth doing a bit of research about how to do that because in the first instance it can be expensive-ish. I would definitely endorse this next one, join your local beekeeping club. It's an excellent source of information You'll get mentors, the, the chap that I've talked to you about, Ian, Kat and I are on the same beekeeping club in Kelvin Valley. Um, and we've got Facebook pages, but the guy who's our secretary is uh, has kept bees for over 40 years. And Ian will say he's not an expert. If there's anything that he doesn't know about beekeeping, I, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't want to know it. And he's a great guy. You can lift him up and... and, and have a phone call and the other thing that we do over the winter we have monthly meetings like this just now zoom calls but we meet together and we often in the summer when it was pre-covid we would have an open day and go to folks gardens or where they kept their bees and had a look at the different hives 
And it's a really good source of information, very practical, not techie. And, and I quite, there's a lot of uh, and similarities between beekeepers, I think, and allotment holders. Very practical people. Um, they have sensible approaches to things. And for example, in a beekeeping club, the other side of that is there can be pieces of equipment that you can get access to. A honey extractor, for example, which can be expensive-ish, a couple of hundred pounds. We've got one that we can lend out to members. Um, so it's, it's worth thinking about that. The other thing that I did was I joined the Scottish Beekeeping Association. Um, it's a good source of information. They have quite fairly straightforward videos. During lockdown, they've had Zoom um, events, etc. And I've put insurance there. The insurance is, a, you know, they insure your hives against vandalism, for example, or uh, whatever, and that can happen in allotments. Hasn't happened to my bees, but I've, we've had reports. Uh, one of our, our members in our beekeeping club recently had vandalism on his hives. So it's good for that, but it also it gives you public liability insurance. So that sounds a bit techy, but if people um, are worried about the beehives, et cetera, getting stung in things, you're covered for that. Um, but your, your basic membership will cover you for up to five hives. And if you're a hobbyist, that's probably a reasonable thing to do, a, 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 not, um, the, a, a reasonable number of hives to have. Um, they're a great talking point in the allotment. The number of times people come round and go, hi Delia, how are the bees doing? Well, I don't name them. There's thousands of bees in a hive, but people are fantastically interested. And also I get great reports back from people, albeit anecdotally, that people have said, and Jane touched on this, about pollination of fruit, etc. I've had reports back from people saying that there are better fruit crops since the bees have been around. And, and that makes sense because that's what they're there for. And I've put on the bottom, honey is a great bonus. I, I keep my bees because I'm interested. I like the stuff around the environment, but you do get the honey from them, which is quite nice for sharing and, and giving to people. It's a great present at Christmas. People love it. Can I have the next slide, please, Scott? This is when my bees arrived in the first instance. Um, they literally, inside a hive, you, people may know this, but that was me setting up my hives. That box on the right-hand side of the picture, that was the box that these frames came in. These frames go into your hive. And when you're getting a colony like that delivered, there's probably about eight, 10,000 bees in that. One queen and the rest are workers. So it'll be all female bees one queen and the rest are around that and they go into your hive. In a really busy summer, people always ask me this question, when it's hot and quite, um, things that the bees are active, you can get up to maybe 30, 40,000, 50,000 bees in a, in a very active hive. So that's not untypical. So that was my first lot of bees arriving and you get got a picture of that. On to my next slide. And I do look like an alien. Someone told me that recently when I was checking them out. I've got to give Margaret a credit for this. She sent me this picture the other day. This is one of my bees out in Margaret's snowdrops a week and a half ago. And Margaret sent it to me, so hence the talking point. And I thought that was quite nice. February 21. The bees are starting to come out now. The weather's getting a wee bit warmer. There's, it's still too cold for to properly open up the hives, but they're starting to come out. And that orange on that bees, that honeybee's leg, that's pollen. So they'll take that back to the hive and it's a source of protein for the bees. So they need that to, um, uh, to survive. And also, depending on the pollen that they bring in, the honey can taste different depending what they forage on. Can I have the next slide, please, Scott? Right, allotment open days. Um, in Springburn, last few years, we've had an annual open day. Didn't have it this year or the last year, obviously because of COVID, but we do, the different plot holders do different things. And we have an open day in Barbary Crew, which tracks probably certainly over a hundred, maybe 120 people. And I do a session on bees and I've usually got a, a queue of people round my fence, want to come in and see them. I'm always very cautious about what people will and won't do, but it's always an interest to people. And um, so it's, it's a talking point, if nothing else. 
And can you go on to the next slide? Because this is another, I think, the next one. That is, that's one of my friends who came down. I've got a spare suit and he was so interested. He wanted to put a suit on. So he's really enthusiastic and wanted to actually get into the house. You've got to be careful, but I was fairly confident he was fine. He's contacted me before, but normally it's, you know, people come down and they, they ask you lots and lots of questions because they're just really interested. I also find, you can go on to the next slide, please, Scott. These are my grandchildren that got me involved and I bought them suits. Um, so they're quite fascinated. But when you have children coming, it's part of the curriculum in Scotland for primary school children, um, particularly the tiny E ones, they're really um, into bees and can ask you the most insightful and really informed in questions. So that's Charlie and Elena and they're, that's a few years ago and I got them suits and they were fascinated with this. But often the children are, are really, really enthusiastic and I would want to encourage that in the future because we would want you know, to keep, hopefully get some future beekeepers uh, to do that. Can I have the next slide, please, Scott? This was an article, um, it was, I was asked to write for the Scottish Allotments Association uh, magazine about keeping bees on an allotment. So information sharing is really important. The kind of stuff we're doing tonight, and that's the picture of, um, uh, Fraser and I, that at the open day, went into the article. And that was fairly basic, setting up an, an, um, on an allotment. But I got loads of questions from that. Um, can I have the next one? And this one was one of our other um, plot holders. We have several different nationalities in Springburn, and one of the plot holders is Polish. Well, a couple of them, but this guy in particular. In beehives, the, uh, there is a mite that can burrow into the, the hives called Varroa, and you treat the, the hives every year for that. But he was telling me that the, the chemical that you use in the UK is not allowed in Poland. So they use rhubarb leaves uh, instead of oxalic acid, and the bees uh, chew into the, the, the rhubarb leaves and take it down through the hive. So that was something that I'd never heard of and folks were quite interested in the beekeeping club because it's not something that, that we do. So hence you're always learning. Can I have the next slide, please? And there we go. This is honey that came straight out of the hive. You'll see some bees in that. Um, and that was stuff that I got last year. And if you go on to the next slide, that's what it looks like when it's it's um, been extracted. So you have to you have lots of wax, you have honey, and and all of that. I get about twenty kilos of honey last year, and it, I just gave it away. Or you know, my my grandchildren love it. Um, but that was that was a harvest last year, and again, people love it at Christmas. They think it's a real treat because it's not obviously it's not pasteurized honey, and the pollen in it makes it taste differently. And my next slide was, that was a Christmas present I got last year, a very nice uh, pot with, that was my honey in that as well. Can I go on to the last slide, Scott? So people always ask about swarms and really worry, no, sorry, the, the swarms, sorry, I thought it was my last one. People always worry about swarms. Um, it's the way honeybees continue to develop. So when the hives get really, really big, when the colonies get big, they'll split. And what happens is the bees create another queen and the queen, the existing queen will gather round, um, the bees will gather around the queen and can't help me to catch that swarm. That was on my fence down at the allotment a couple of years ago. And actually when the bees are swarming, that they're not that aggressive. They've taken in a lot of honey. They're quite sleepy and they, they're going to go and find somewhere else to live. So if you can catch them, that you get another free colony and another free hive. So you don't have to pay for that. And so if you're in a beekeeping club, for example, we will get phone calls every year from people who have swarms. So if you're prepared to go and catch it, you can set up another colony 
um, and the bees are for free, just take your time. Last year, ironically, I got one, and we reckon it was out of Low Moss Prison, because they've got hives up there, just up the road from me, up in Bishop Riggs. So they're not scary, and you literally catch them in a box, put them into a hive, and they do their thing. Can I have the next one, please? And that's just, that was last summer. Um, wildflowers, I plant quite a lot of wildflowers, uh, what, what Jane was saying, and that's my hives. I've got three hives, but that's two of them. And they're, it's a really pleasant thing to do. I can, you know, take a cup of tea, sit down and watch the bees coming in and out, because it's quite a, a, a pleasant experience to do on a sunny afternoon in your, your allotment. And I would encourage you to do it. If you're interested, get in touch. People do regularly um, and, you know, let me know when we can, I can give you a bit more of a steer. But I do underline it, I am not an expert. Any questions? <laughs> can I ask how, obviously my interest is in the wild bee population. Uh -huh. Always I have this little worry because there are tens of thousands, I think, in an average beehive and a couple of hundred in your bumblebee hives and all your lone bees. How, how do you make sure or do you suggest that people make sure if they're going to set up a beehive that there is enough food for everybody? Well, I mean, I think bees can fly a radius, honeybees, a radius of five miles. But on an allotment site, I mean, it's just... It, well, they don't, hopefully they don't die touching wood here, but there's so much foraging in such a short um, geographic area that they, they, they have a lot of foraging literally on their doorsteps. But quite often in cities, you were talking about being in a city, like for example, there are beehives in the roof of the city chambers in Glasgow. The bees will find foraging in all sorts of interesting places. So I don't think there's going to be an issue of a shortage of bees. It's to your point, it's... it's um, yeah, it's more that it, it, in some allotments, it depends on the allotment. I mean, some places encourage more than just fruit and vegetables. You know, they may be yes. flowers and all sorts of things. And it would be one that I would like if people were thinking about it in their allotment, that they would maybe do a bit of a campaign and get people to grow more things for bees so there's plenty of food Absolutely. for everybody because I, I don't know um you know i just i just, it just worries me slightly that's all right <laughs> so people positive do benefit, come... but what about the wild bees uh, absolutely and people but our site in springburn is 11 acres um, it, it's a big site and, and there's a big wild area at the back and yes. like you i plant or well, you saw on my, my floor i plant wildflowers and things I do it every year I plant vegetables and stuff too but people like to come and ask me and say you know can I can I do a wee thing so uh, that's good can I it's do a wee area so when when we have an open days people ask about that they certainly ask me um so I encourage people to do that just to even plant a corner Margaret's great Margaret's plot she's got lots of wild um uh flowers and things there and that kind of thing encourages folks to hopefully do that and one of this actually you know well speaking of this this is actually a really good segue across to Kat's presentation which is all yes. about planting for bees so Kat how do you want to come in here and, and pick up this part and then we can go straight into what you're going to show uh, yeah I am I've never heard of I am not having enough food for for bees but I can imagine it might happen at some point depending on the, the habitat around you. But yeah, as Jane says, just grow as mu much as you can for, for bees and hopefully I can try and steer you in a wee bit of, of that direction. I, um, I just wanted to kind of go through, um, start off with the kind of parts of the flower and then, and then go straight into, um, uh, what do you call it, um, the different types of plants we can grow. So I am, um, the kind of most important parts of a flower that the bees are interested in is anthers, uh, where the pollen sits, um, and they'll rub past and, and walk down past the anthers, transferring pollen onto the bodies of the bees, down into the base of the flower, where the petals are, um, where all the nectar is. Um, they, um, 
they'll go around there and spend a bit of time and then crawl back up and probably get covered in more pollen. And then they'll go to the next flower and they'll do the same, but some of that pollen from the first flower will get transferred onto this, this stigma. Um, but the, the front of the, the, the center of the flower generally, and then the pollen will get transferred down into the ovule and seeds will um, be created, germinated and in, in, in for the next year sort of thing. So um, the, the petals which store the, the nectar at the bottom of the flowers is really important for, for bees because uh, Nectar is um, carbohydrate for bees, and as Delia said earlier, pollen is their protein, and they need both um, to survive. All, all, probably all um, pollinators need both of these to, to keep keep going. Um, there's uh, different types of flowers: um, bell-shaped flowers, open uh, daisy sort of flowers. Um, and then there's multiple petaled flowers. Bees seem to stay away from the kind of multiple petaled, big blousy type, um, like kind of roses type type flowers because they can't get into to the nectar um, or the pollen. Um, and the, the, the different variety of bees will go to different flowers because they've got different lengths of tongues. So. You'll see bumblebees go into um, foxgloves and uh, daffodils and things like that because their tongues are longer and they can get down into, into the base of the flower. Um, some of the, the flowers will produce more pollen than others and some will produce more nectar than others. There's also um, color of flowers that seem to attract bees more because they can see an ultraviolet light. So violet, purples and blues seem to be a most popular color. Um, the, uh, they also, some of the petals will have stripes and spots that will be seen in ultraviolet light so the bees can see, right, I'm going down here to the base of the flower to, to drink the, the nectar. Um, what else have I got here? Mm, yeah, next slide, please, Scott, actually. So these are various shapes, sizes, colors of pollen um, under a, a extreme microscope. And it's amazing the variety that the, the, there is for, for all the different flowers um, and plants on, on, in the world. So um, I just thought I would share that so you could see, because you can't physically see that with your naked eye. It's, it's just, they're so tiny. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as I said, the, the bees will, will go down past all, all of the pollen and you can see this poor bee absolutely smothered in, in yellow pollen. And what she'll do is um, eventually between visiting flowers, she'll scrape her body um, and our, our anthers, um, our, our antennae, sorry, all, all of the pollen off her body down into our back legs um, and store them in pollen baskets so that she can carry on and uh, forage some more. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Some of the things that you could probably do, which would be quite good for the kids to do, um, is maybe put out wee feeding stations for um, bees and possibly butterflies as well. Uh, normally, you could uh, soak the sponge there on the left hand side with a uh, sugar and water solution. Um, and um, tops of bottles, um, attach them to a stake, whether it's glue or staples or whatever. And you can see some of those bumblebees um, having a, a, a drink out of the, the caps. Um, and it means that they're, it'll be fairly safe. They can go in and have a drink, especially if they're tired and, and, the, and it's maybe not as sunny, so they're not getting up, getting warmed up. That, a wee bit of uh, extra food just to get them home again is, is really useful. So the next slide, please, Scott, is basically a list of all of all of a lot of plants. Some of these um, I think are American and I've never heard of them, but I grabbed it and thought it was quite good. Um, so planting for bees for all the year round um, as much as possible will start in the springtime. I am. Um, Spring bulbs like um, snowdrops, crocuses, um, 
really help. I, I saw the bees out, out today in my snowdrops in my garden, um, foraging away, and, and it really um, gets them going for the, for the, the, the next few months ahead. I, and then the daffodils, when they come out, um, the bumblebees all, all go into them when they start coming out of hibernation to get going with them to start their colonies up for the year. Uh, and then the next sort of flower that I can remember will be coming out is the, the cherry blossom uh, and apple blossom. Um, and then from then on, it just goes crazy with all the different flowers. Um, for fruit and veggies, brambles, blueberries, um, raspberries, strawberries, black currants, all of these are, are what we would love because we love soft fruits and the bees love them because they're going to get a lot of food from them. Um, and then herbs, they're, they're flowering a lot. You know, chives flower fairly on in, in the year right through to and so does rosemary. Sometimes you may get two batches of flowers from, from rosemary out, out of the year. Um, and then mint, kind of maybe later on in the summer, are all really, really good for, for planting for bees. Um, and some cut flowers like um, sunflowers, um, single marigolds, poppies, um, single flowering asters, um, dahlias as well are, re are really, really good if you're wanting a few more flowers um, just to kind of brighten the your allotment plot up. Uh, and then right, normally around the edge of your allotment site um, or, or kind of between plots, you'll have probably big trees. And the, the really important trees for bees um, are uh, sycamore, horse chestnut, uh, rowan, lime as well they and they're all flowering at slightly different periods throughout the year and and they'll all um be vast amounts of food for for bees and then towards the end of the year um himalayan balsam um although as a thug and not british and a lot of folk want to get rid of it it's, it's so important for bees later on in the year whether it's honeybees or bumblebees um, if you ever see a, a white bee in the late summer, autumn time, and they kind of look a bit ghostly, it's because they're covered in white pollen from the Himalayan balsam. Um, and they'll take that back um, and, and store it um, for, for the winter time. And then there's Christmas roses. Um, and uh, Mahonia is meant to be really good uh, as well. And then Ivy, as, as Jane had said earlier, um, ivies flowers late on in, in uh, October time, actually nearly, um, if not later. Um, and the bees, if they're out, will we'll, um, use that and store it um, to survive special honeybees to store it um, throughout the winter. Um, next slide, please. And I'll quickly shut up. <laughs> so as Jane said, we need bees, we need, we need pollinators to keep us going, keep the world going. And all of these plants, wild garlic, eh, watermelon, sunflowers, oranges, lemons, cherries, apples, um, we all need pollinators to, to grow these plants. Otherwise, we're all going to have to go around with a little paintbrush and do the pollination ourselves. Um, so we really need to help them out and plant as many um, plants, flowers for, for bees and, and butterflies as, mu as much as we can. The next couple of slides, I think, are just um, um, just other things like red currant, uh, runner beans, peas, kale, if you want to leave that to seed, um, sage and marjoram. Yeah, yeah they're, they're all really good. I think I've got one more, which is just a composition of lots of different um, in case I'd forgotten any. Um, and then the last slide is just my wee cat sitting in the sunshine in amongst the crocuses, just having a great time in the, the spring sunshine. So one thing that I would I would would love for you to take away would be if you can grow something um, to help bees, a sunflower especially is really, really good. Sunflowers from small three foot, you know, or less 
to, as you know, big giant um, have a competition with sunflowers because sunflowers are so fantastic for for bees of all kinds um, and with our big massive big flowers there's loads of room for for loads of bees to come in and um, get pollen and nectar from and then when when it's all uh, the flower is finished and it goes to seed then you'll get little blue tits and and the uh, great tits coming to to feed off the seed of the the sunflower so I would I would love to see a big mass of growth of sunflowers in everybody's plot this year, if if nothing else. Thank you. Let's see if there's any questions. Yeah, Bab, uh, Chris, have you been keeping an eye on the chat? Well, I had the slides up there. Do we have any questions waiting in the wings already? Yes, there was one um, um, much much earlier when when. Uh, Delia was talking, so I'll read that one from Janie. Um, she's really interested in bees, but worried about harvesting honey, uh, that harvesting honey causes the death of a certain amount of bees every time. Is this true? Um, as I said, I only take a certain amount of honey. Um, you have to leave a good uh, batch of the honey for your beehive, uh, for your colony in the hive. Um, I, if you do it as a hobbyist, you're not doing it commercially, and, and it's quite a different approach. Um, so I take your point, the honey, the bees make the honey so that they survive. So for example, at the moment, my bees have used up all their honey. So you can supplement that by feeding them and I, they've got fondant and I make my own fondant and give it to them because there's no additives in it. But you're right, the bees make the honey for themselves. It's quite a nice bonus to get some, but I, you wouldn't take it all. And I think hobbyists tend not to do that. Commercial beekeeping is quite different. And there are pros and cons around that. That There aren't massive number of commercial beekeepers in Scotland. Um, in the States, there was lots and they moved them around and that's problematic. Um, but generally what we are talking about here is hobbyists and the majority of the, the honey would be left for, I would leave the majority for my bees. Cat can comment as well, but you know, you do get some, but the majority of it, I would leave for the bees. Cat, do you want to comment on that? You agree? I think, I think you've said everything, yeah. <laughs> um, does that also cover it for oh. you? Sorry? Sorry, Chris, what are you saying? Oh, I was going to say, um, there are also uh, two other questions, actually both from Abby, um, asking about wild beekeeping, or what do you think about wild beekeeping, like where hives? Warren. And, <laughs> Sorry, what, Abby, actually, Warren. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think the other question was answered um, that she had about bumble, uh, bumble and honeybees liking different flowers, but I think that that, that was covered, but uh, yes. Yeah, that, that was me answering a question, actually. Yeah, that was, <laughs> yeah it's, the, it's their size. You know, a honeybee is much smaller than a bumblebee, so they can't go into some of the bigger flowers. And cat covered that, I think. The, the, the warehouse is a type of hive, and it's, while beekeeping is, it, 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 well, if you're keeping honeybees, it's it's not the same as, as wild bees. It's just not there is a certain amount of animal welfare involved in it. And wild beekeeping is, is kind of what we're talking about. And you wouldn't be taking any honey away from the bees effectively. You would just leave it with them and it's all about the environment. So yes, that does happen. There is still a certain amount, if you've got honeybees, they still need a certain amount of, uh, call it care, if you like, make sure that the varroa mite that's not there are touched on, uh, make sure that if they're swarming, that you catch it and put it in another hive or you'll lose them. So, so there are things you still have to do, but it's, it's about the environment more than uh, being a, a commercial approach. D does that help, Abby? Uh, yeah, I've got a few friends who are sort of wild bee enthusiasts and they, they pour scorn on my standard British hive. Um, and they, they keep them in sort of upturned, upturned plant pots and stuff like that. But they, they, they encourage that kind of habit. But then they don't take any of the honey at all either. Yeah, so, that's, yeah. I'm also, I'm also that's, really that's their choice. Uh, absolutely. Um, it's more about the environment. And that's absolutely fine. 
Yeah. And Abby, just before we come back to you for for it looks like we're not going to get the council officer um, Gillian in with us tonight. But just before we come back to you for the for for your angle on things, uh, I had a message that's not in the open chat, but Patricia in the crowd has a couple of uh, pointers on things she wanted to say that you must do uh, from her experience of beekeeping. Would you like to come in and yeah, just unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we yeah. can hear you. Right. Go ahead. Um, this is some um, musts that I haven't heard mentioned, and they're very, very important. I'm a member of the Glasgow Beekeepers Association, and uh, one of the first things you learn is never, ever buy bees from outside Scotland, because Scotland is relatively um, free of disease. And if you buy from outside, you're bringing in diseases we don't have already. Um, and before you even think about starting to buy bees and equipment, you must go to an association, sign up and learn all about it. Do a course, do the basic beekeeping course um, and learn about what it's all about and how much it's going to cost you and everything else before you do anything, because it's too, too late to gather them together and then start learning about them. Um, what else, what else? Um, and join the, joining the association must be one of the first things that you do, but they're the two most important. Join an association and never buy bees outside Scotland. The Scottish beekeepers will tie you from the highest tree if you do. <laughs> <laughs> but all the other information tonight seems very sound. Thank it's you. And um, I, I agree about the outside Scotland. It's, it's, it, you're right about um, disease, but you're also it, it's about the um, y your um, you know people import. You hear about people importing bees, for example, from Italy. It's a completely different climate, different diseases. You don't want to do that. Yeah. Although one of the worst diseases recently, there was a, an instance in Fife where they had. Um, they to burn the, the Scottish government have bee inspectors, believe it or not, yeah. and they to burn some hives because it was a, a really serious disease. So they can do that, they can condemn them. It's rare in Scotland, so Patricia's absolutely right. Um, it, it, it's it's make sure that you, you, you're as local as possible is, is what you would recommend. Patricia, you, you mentioned there that the beekeepers would hang you from the highest tree. And I was just thinking about how it's the most threatening thing we've heard from any of the allotment keepers all, all, all week, Hopefully but it's still, that, it's that connected. <laughs> <laughs> At least it was still connected with nature because uh, it was yeah. being tied from a tree. That was the first, <laughs> it was the first threat that came into my mind. They wouldn't do it. <laughs> they would be very, very, very angry. <laughs> but uh, th thinking about the, the time that we have left, and it's a shame that, that um, our, the council officer couldn't join us, but we do still have Abby. <laughs> so with half of the round table left, we have half of the round table people here. Uh, Abby, you work with Propagate um, and we were gonna have an, uh, a conversation about um, nature friendly growing. So do you have some thoughts that you'd like to throw in here? Yeah, I mean, I've just been, been as, as I did last time, taking notes all the way through. I, I also have have bees. I've only got one, one hive at the moment. Um, and I, I was blessed with a swarm so I was. Uh, it just it just arrived and hung itself from a branch just a little way from my from my house, uh, in such an easy way that it, all I had to do was take a pair of secateurs. It was on a broom bush, and yeah, I got the box ready. Pair of secateurs into the box. Um, somebody had given me a whole load of boxes, um, that high hive boxes for my 40th birthday, which is now three years ago, but at that point was two years previous, and I'd, I'd done nothing with them apart from kept them in a, in, a, in the garage kind of thing. Um, it's like hastily assembling these boxes <laughs> into what I hoped for my long distance has been a very long time. So I did a beekeeping course, um, like downloading things off the internet, going, "Oh, how does that bit go together?" Um, yeah, so managed to manage to get they, they've survived the winter. They've been out and about, so. They, <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, propagate. We 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 work with all all sorts of different people. Um, not just in Glasgow these days, we're based in Dumfries and Galloway and also up in Iona and Mull 
uh, and we do kind of a broad range of food education kind of work. Um, so teaching people how to grow food, helping people set up their own gardens, community growing spaces, um, teaching people how to cook with vegetables, that kind of thing. Um, and also kind of quite a lot of work around sort of food systems, that, that's a, well, biodiversity and in, in, in sort of um, nature friendly growing are a really important part of our sort of food systems future. And I think they kind of, there's, there's quite a lot of noise we made about them at the moment. Um, Gillian, who is going to be here, that she's kind of leading on a council project called Connecting Nature. They've got a, a seminar coming up in March on the 23rd, 24th and 25th, I think it is. Um, a big, big global seminar. So I'm speaking at that as well about the role of community gardens in um, kind of creating sort of wildlife corridors and, and nature corridors. Um, but something that we always do through Propagate, and I think it's the same with lots of other community growing spaces, is, is exactly what all the speakers tonight have been saying, and that's kind of encouraging spaces within those gardens um, for a bit of rewilding, from, for lots of wildflowers, for planting that is specifically for, for bees and for butterflies, but also for bird feeding as well. And for me, the biggest part of that is around the education. Um, because obviously community growing spaces are, are kind of open to lots of people, um, multiple users, whether they're school children or adults with additional support needs or people with mental health problems or general people in the wider community. And they become this amazing space where people can connect and learn. Um, yeah, because, uh, you know, we, we, I think every single child I've ever worked with has, has gone <laughs> at the sight of a bee, you know, and um, I was doing a really nice project in 2019 with Baltic Street Adventure Playground, um, which is in Dalmarnock. <clears throat> and um, we planted up a, in, in amongst the, the, the black currant bushes and the red currant bushes, we just sowed loads of phacelia. Um, and I'm sure many of you as allotment holders will be very familiar with phacelia, but if you're not, it's one of the most beautiful annual flowers. It's, um, it's a green manure because it, it, it helps to fix nutrients in the ground and, and sort of stops them from moving about too much. Um, it grows really fast and annual and it has these beautiful kind of furry, um, almost caterpillar-like um, purple, purple flowers, uh, clusters of flowers and bumblebees specifically absolutely love them. Um, so we initially had all the children kind of panicking at the sight of bees and people being quite stressed by the fact there was bees there. But we managed to turn that around with, with, um, with things like the yeah, bug scopes and um, you can get like um, sheets that you can print off off the internet, which have got you know, different different types of bees and identification for them. So you turn it into a fun educational activity and by the end of it, you know, people are absolutely loving the bees. Um, and it's, yeah, I think, I was had them on the palm of my hand and giving them a little stroke and kind of going, look, they're, they're not, they're not dangerous at all. They're totally fine. Obviously, that's bumblebees, not honeybees, which can be a little bit aggressive at times. But <laughs> you wouldn't want to stroke a honeybee. <laughs> but the cute little bumblebees, they're they're very they're very strokeable, aren't they? Um, yeah. So for me, I think it, it's it's about trying to incorporate. Um, uh, the, the sort of nature friendly uh, techniques and biodiversity into uh, food growing spaces um, but using that as a tool to, to educate people and connect people with nature and uh, and with the wonders of biodiversity around us and and as um, several people have said you know the, the, the pollinating insects so in my polytunnel um, last year I grew the most amazing runner beans um, at least the plants were amazing um, <laughs> The flowers were flowering. I thought, going to have loads of runner beans, going to be great. Did I have any runner beans? No, <laughs> because there were no bees coming in and pollinating my runner beans. So I had to go and um, kidnap bees. So I got a jam jar, <laughs> um, tracked down a whole load of uh, bumblebees that were feasting on some hedge wound wort, which is a really nice sort of hedgerow wildflower. Uh, clamped them into a, a jam jar. Sorry, bees and bee lovers, but and then ran to the polytunnel. <laughs> release them and I was just like there you go enjoy and bring your friends next time um, and it works it totally works um, and I think that they, they must have done the little waggle dance and told all their pals where the where the, the excellent runner run bean flowers were um, I had runner beans galore but before that I was going around with a paintbrush <laughs> just like I've never had to do that manually <laughs> so yeah you mentioned earlier something that I, I, you, I wanted to pick up on and come back to. 
because I don't actually know very much about it. And I, I'm here helping organize this. And I know that Gillian was going to talk about the Connecting Nature project, but I haven't had any briefing on it myself. So I'm going to make an assumption that there are other people in the audience who, who don't know anything about it either. But what, what is that? And uh, how much is Glasgow involved? Or is that something that's developing just now? Okay. I'm not speaking from a position of absolute confidence here, so, um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to get some stuff wrong. But I have been kind of peripherally involved with a few projects that the council came to us with and said, here, can you think about being involved with this? And it didn't really work out for various different reasons. A couple of sites, mainly due to contamination, actually, um, contaminated grounds. Uh, so it was meant to be like food growing spaces. But right, it's an EU funded project, um, which uh, means that there's lots of different um, connecting nature strands. Um, uh, all, all over uh, UK, but also the rest of the continent. Um, and it's about creating, so Julian used to be, I was just looking her up um, through my emails and last, last contact I had to have with her, she was trying to get a, a, a photo in before her actually. Um, and yeah, she, she's kind of like green infrastructure sort of person. That's her, that's her thing, is sort of planning and green infrastructure. So it's, it's about kind of creating spaces um, on what would be previously vacant and derelict land uh, to, to kind of, yeah, increase biodiversity, increase the kind of ecological benefits um, and create spaces for, for nature in different ways. Um, so the, oh, I should find a link for it, shouldn't I? The, the hot, it's, it's um, I don't know, it's on the Propagate Facebook. Uh, so, I don't know, someone wants to go to the Propagate know. Facebook page really quickly. Um, I'm not sure if you're looking for if you're looking for the connecting nature page itself. I've just put the link to Gillian's profile from that in the chat. So there's a link to connectingnature.eu. Is that is that the one you're looking for, or are you looking for a Glasgow specific thing? There's the actual. Oh, looks. Um, yeah, there's that, but there's also the, the the sign up for the webinar itself. So there's this three day conference that's happening, um, and if you were to look at the Propagate Facebook page, um, one of the most recent things that uh, Susan, who was our social media person, she was in, in the audience earlier, um, she she posted it earlier on. So it's you can sign up there. Um, I'm speaking on day two, and they've asked me to do. I think the the, the theme is healing sick cities. <laughs> It's an interesting concept, healing six cities, and they've asked me to do a bit on the role of community growing spaces um, in connecting connecting people to nature and connect and making nature connections. Um, and I think there's lots of other stuff going on as well. I, I don't I don't know enough about it to be honest, Scott, to be able to to kind of say much more. But I think that that webinar looks great and it's free, um, crucially. And I don't think there's speakers from um, <clears throat> from all over. There we go. Is that Morag managed to put it on there? Well done, Morag. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, speakers from all over uh, the world, I think, <laughs> as far as I can make out. Um, yeah, no, it looks really good. Great. We will uh, we will share a link to that on the click on the GAF Facebook page as well. I'm assuming a lot of people here would have heard about that, uh, this event through our Facebook group, I should say, not page. So we'll make sure we share some information about that when it comes up too. I, I think uh, I think they've got a lot of money. <laughs> money has been a theme if anyone has been at our feb best events over the last few days we've been pushing the council on things like the vacant and derelict like land funds and, and trying to make sure that money doesn't disappear with the end of the financial year and the leader of the council was on last night and said essentially no you know annual deadlines come up but the money will always be there um, year on year there will always be some my understanding because the derelict land fund is they've ring fenced some money for for helping to implement the food growing strategy which is great but yeah, I think that's that's not going to that's not going to sort of encompass all the things that we that we want to do. You know, um, yeah, I think there's, there's huge opportunities around vacant and derelict lands, and uh, whether it's food growing or um, sort of better biodiversity and ecological systems. And yeah, there's a, there's, there's lot, lots and lots of potential. Um, and my understanding is the Connected Nature project has has some some cash um, that they can support community projects with. But again, don't quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Judy, you've got your hand up there, your virtual hand. Yeah, I was going to say that I think the um, Seven Locks project is part of the Connecting Nature. Is that right, Abby? I think so, yes. Yeah, now you've yeah. said that, that rings a bell. Yeah, yeah that's um, yeah. Scott, Scott yeah. Ferguson's project, isn't it? He's, yeah, the uh, really big one. Um, out, by, out by Easter House. Yeah, that's yeah. right, going out that way. And um, they, they've also sort of, I mean, they're supporting things like stall spaces. 
and that was Gillian Dix, one of Gillian Dix's particular babies, I think, which is very, very keen on. Um, but the last night, I think um, Susan Aitken said there was this um, tiny forest initiative, and that's going up with the Seven Locks project as well. And there's a lot of stuff going on up there. There was a post about that on the Rewild, the Rewilding Scotland Facebook group uh, yesterday. So they, they, there has been a tiny forest created. So I don't know if I another, another concept of this. Is, and I, I, maybe that is part of the Connecting Nature project as well. But the idea is that you plant um, a whole load of trees really, really, really close together. So loads of trees in a tiny space. And um, it works quite well in tropical climates. So I'm, I've kind of done, done a bit of reading on it. And I, I think the jury's out in my head. Um, as to whether it's a, a sensible approach in, in our in our hemisphere in our Scottish climate, because um, it is essentially encouraging this survival of the fittest um, kind of thing. But the, the trees kind of encourage each other to grow and grow faster and grow taller. I'm I'm less convinced. Um, and but it's gone ahead in Easter House. It's it's happened. Um, there's a pilot project underway. And it's, it's, been, it's been planted and it's got a fence around it. And it's all it's all go. I was arguing with Scott last night about it. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think going back to what we've heard from um, Jane and, and Brian, you know, it, it's particularly habitats. And I think that um, hopefully that people encourage all allotments, community gardens and, and people's ordinary gardens um, to start growing more um, plants for bees and for birds. Because we, we sort of, the birds are really important as well. And um, it's the and I was also wanting to ask Jane about the habitats for bees, um, for bumblebees and things. I mean, is it just pollinating, or are there other habitats that you need to put in for them? Is Jane still there? What, what do you mean? Um, where they, what you can do for for them, habitat-wise, or I'm not sure what you mean. Yeah, habitat-wise. I mean, you know, where do they sleep? Where do they where hibernate? Do they, the bumblebees. Nobody's been very successful with the bumblebees actually creating nests for them. They, they, they're very much, very, very fussy and they do their own thing. If you watch them in the spring and they're out and they're looking for things, but seemingly they, they're happiest where there has been a reasonable amount of mice, but a reasonable amounts of cats that catch the mice. So they use the ex mice burrows because if they go down a mouse burrow and there's a mouse there, it will eat the bumblebee. But so they, they do well there, but we probably, I don't think the bumblebee conservation have come up with any consistent way that you can create bumblebee habitat, they're fussy. The tree bees are not fussy at all. They just, they, as I said before, you know, they were down a jacket, you know, a jacket lining. We had some in our lockup in the middle of Glasgow and what is really a wind tunnel underneath the kind of multi-story flats. They did great there, they were very, very happy. Um, and also in our, our strawberry bin, and most years they would have been okay. And um, the solitary bees are easier to cater for from, from a person's point of view. And that would be your leaf cutter bees, you know, a kind of a hole diagonally drilled in any kind of woods and kind of turned away from the rain or in your huts, you know, a, a, a long tunnel, they'll, they'll find it. You see them going in and having a look and going, oh, that looks good. Um, and rotten wood as well, you know, sort of turned away from the rain and with a, with a hole kind of punched into it. And then there's lots of solitary bees that don't look like bees. And I think then, yes, the kind of advice that you'll get online about making like bee hotels with tubes and areas gives them a place, the mm. solitary bees. But the bumblebees are probably just so fussy that, you know, you, you just follow them around and see if they're, they're living anywhere. But I don't think anybody's been able to create their habitat but as long as we remember to grow as many different kinds of flowers, and, and as um, was said, not the kind of, you know, domesticated multi, you know, kind of petal jobs, but wild things that grow in your area or, um, you know, easy flowers to grow. There's plenty of sites will tell you which ones the bees like. We kind of grow a selection of them. So it covers the, the, the whole um, kind of growing season, but also the, the thing I said, you know, even if you don't want to do that, let some of your crop go to seed because the, our purple broccoli was the surprise. They just went completely berserk and it flowered and flowered and flowered, you know. Can I just say, I love that. I heard that from my wife, that she encourages cats, that equals more bees. 
<laughs> ah, the bumblebee, yeah. can do, can do, because it eats the mice. But also then, um, the other thing, the only other, the last thing I was going to say is just watch your water butts and any, you know, I turn all my um, kind of pots and stuff like that that would collect water, you know, that I use for weeding, um, you know, pails, turn them upside down because they, they go and have a drink and you find them all drowned if you're not careful, but you can actually fish them out quickly. I dry them off in the um, kitchen roll and then warm them up one way or the other in my hand or next to my stomach or in the sunshine or something like that so that they fly off. And I love the, the sponges and the little bottle tops with the sugar water. So our grandchildren give out emergency bumblebee rescuing kits with sashes of sugar and a little bit of water. You mix it up and they, they feed them in London, in the middle of London to rescue them because sometimes they just run out of energy. And I thought that was super hanging them up because we do, you know, feed them if they're, it's a particularly cold day and they're kind of lying around, you know, we'll feed them and, and off they go, you know, they're, they're really super and easy to help. And the kids love them. Our, our grandson, let's say, you know, walking up his arm up and down, you know, they're, they're very, very tame. <laughs> Brave. Delia, you've got your hand up. Would you like to, I'm, I'm, I am. For everybody who's looking at it, I'm conscious of the time. So Delia, would you like to finish us off tonight? Even what Jane says, just the difference between bumblebees and honeybees. Honeybees are a bit more aggressive, but they're fine. I mean, they're fine um, because they can only sting you once and sting you, they die. So they're not keen in stinging you. It's just they're protecting the territory. But your water butts on, if you have water butts for your environment on your floor, try and put a fine mesh or something with weights on it so that the bees can get a drink, but they don't drown. Um, I've gone through various options with my water butts, but a very fine mesh on it, uh, or, or a cover completely, um, that doesn't let it fill, but it's important because they'll drown. They do I, drown. I did like the wee bottle tops, I thought they were terrific. Yeah, that's a terrific one. We'll get all the, the kids to do that. That's a super one. Yes, but they do drown and you've got, and, and they are, considering they've been around for a very long time and they're still with us, they are remarkably stupid bumblebees. You know, they, they, they work their way into your hut, but do not work their way out. Your average wasp, you just leave it, it will find its way out. Not the bumblebees that go meep, meep, meep <laughs> against the glass. So we have a bumblebee rescue. You know, we have a jam jar and a card and the kids go, Granny Jane, Granny Jane, bumblebee rescue. And we all rush in and, and rescue because they are very thick. And they will just die because they just keep trying to get out the glass, you know. Uh, can I just say one thing, Scott? Oh, Jane made a good point. I missed it out of uh, my um, awful uh, presentation. But a glass is one of the biggest killers for birds in the allotments and in, in the city centres in the city because they fly into glass. So if you've got your greenhouses and your glass, if you just put a sticker on it or something so they don't... We had a horrible happening, oh. we were watching it, uh, having a cheese sandwich, and we saw a really quite a rare bird fly into our greenhouse and completely kill itself. Yeah. If you can just do that, remember that glass is not good for birds in our allotments. Thank That's you. No worries. Well, <laughs> not to end on a downer. I'm just looking at the chat here, and Abby says that she disturbed a colony of bumblebees who were happily living in a compost heap. Abby, you're painting a picture yourself tonight of the the um, bumble bee aggravator in chief across Glasgow and Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> it was just you know, doing what you do with a compost heap and a fork and giving it a you know a bit of a see how it's getting on in there. Oh, his bees flew out. <laughs> yeah, probably tree bees. Well, they're, they're the ones that quite like you know they'll go. Oh, that looks good. I'll just have a compost heap this year. But yeah. as long as you run away fast, they're really quite forgiving. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe some people have changed their minds on whether or not bee, bee, bees are scary. I don't know. Maybe we're no, preaching to the choir not... already, but tonight's been great. We've had presentations on habitat, on the things to feed the bees, on diversity and your plot. Um, it really grabbed a, a lot of the themes that we've been trying to get at with the, the breadth of discussions we've had across FebFest. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. As we said at the start, the recording will be available later. So if you missed any of it, I know that a few of you were messaging saying that you were keen to get the recording afterwards. We'll contact everyone who'd signed up and, and let you know when, when those videos are available. Hopefully sometime next week. 
Um, we have, as I said earlier, two more days tomorrow. We have a, a walk around, a virtual walk, <laughs> since we can't all meet each other in real life, uh, around a new space that's been acquired by Urban Roots, one of the local sort of growing organisations in, in Glasgow, in the afternoon. That's at two o'clock. And we've got a talk from Paul Barham and Jan Nimmo tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening, at the same time as this, from Hamilton Hill, called Our Changing Patch, 10 Years on the Plot. And then music on Sunday, so if you're interested in any of that, glasgowallotments.org slash febfest is the place to go. But for now, those of you who've been at a few of these will recognise these words. Thanks for coming along and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.